We've had a wonderful time of fellowship this morning. We've had a wonderful time of worship with the Lord as the Lord has opened heaven and His presence has been with us. But we turn again this morning to the, the series that we've been on for the last few weeks. We've taken a few breaks here and there um, during anniversary. Uh, others were preaching, and we come back now this morning to power, preaching, persecution, and prayer from the story of the healing of the lame beggar. And we're looking at the, the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're continuing this morning, and we come back to, and I just want to remind, just to remind you again, and this is close to where we ended last week. Have you ever done what is right? Have you ever tried to be fair? Have you ever done a good deed and for what you did and for your kindness, you were repaid not with kindness, but with unkindness? Not with, with fairness, but unfairness. Not with understanding, but misunderstanding. All of us have faced that, haven't we? And we don't like it. And it makes us feel worse than bad it, it's, it's easy to get angry and upset, isn't it? Because we've tried to do something nice. Well, Acts 4, 1 through 3, count yourself in good company. Peter and John, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in the name of Christ, have brought healing to a lame beggar who has never, ever, ever walked. He has not known, he did not know what it was to stand. And through the power of Jesus Christ, Healing has come to him. A complete life transformation. And then beyond that, they're preaching the good news and the gospel to all of these people. They're giving a second chance to the people who had said, crucify Jesus. What good deeds, what good, thing they're, what good things they're doing. And how are they repaid? The temple guards, the captain of the temple guard, the priests and the Sadducees interrupt their preaching and they arrest them and they put them in jail until the morning. So the next time, beloved brothers and sisters, when you feel upset because you have been misunderstood and mistreated, when you've done something good, think of your brothers, Peter and John, and remind yourself that you are not in bad company, you are in good company. You're in good company. Just tell yourself that next time. I'm in good company. I'm in good company, along with Peter and John. And that's what we say. That's what we see. And so we come into this part of the story. And we're talking about persecution. This was the first recorded miracle. But if you go back to Acts chapter 2, as we said already, uh, the writer of Acts, who is, who's the writer of Acts? The earthly writer is? Who? Is it Paul? No. Who is it? Luke. Okay, it's Luke. Luke the doctor. Uh, who's his companion? Paul. Okay, and this is written long after Paul has, uh, has come, after Saul came to the Lord. So Luke is the writer of this. He has written the Gospel of Luke, and then he writes the continuing Gospel of the early church, which is the Gospel, is, which is the book of Acts. And so he's writing, and he begins writing about persecution. This is the first miracle recorded, and now we have the first persecution of the church as well. Now, as we saw last time, they have stopped the message by arresting them. The messengers, sorry. They've stopped the messengers by arresting them. But they cannot stop the message of God. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. The Word of God shall go forth upon the earth to the ends of the earth, to every people, to every tribe, to every tongue, in every generation, in every era, in every time, and nothing shall stop the message of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth. For it is God's will that all should come to salvation and that none should perish. And God invites you and God invites me to be part of this great work that He's doing. But for the moment, the messengers are stopped. And we sometimes are stopped also, aren't we? But when we are faithful, 
the message of God continues. And we see in Acts 4.4, 4, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now told how many? 5,000 men, not counting women and children. As we've said before, don't be offended, women and children. You are not being discounted, but this would be one of the ways that they counted, according to the original Greek and the Roman system, they would count men as the heads of households. Okay, And that's normally they would count by household. And so as the men came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Almost always that was then an opening for the families as well, for the wives and for the children to come to saving knowledge as well. So it increases to this. This is only a few weeks after uh, Jesus has returned to heaven. It is not a long time after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the promise of God, when Jesus said, you wait, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And then when I've sent you the Holy Spirit, you are going to be able to do what I've called you to do. Brothers and sisters, it's still the same today. We cannot do what God has called us to do without the help, the leading, the empowering, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He's the head of the church on the earth today. He's the general. He's the leader. He's the one that guides, equips, and empowers. Give Him His place in your life and in your days and in the church, and God's work will be accomplished and carried out. So, this many believe what happened to Peter and John they're thrown into jail. You know why they don't do anything that evening? Because according to Jewish law, it was illegal to have a trial at night. Mm. So let me ask you something. Just a few weeks earlier, had there been a trial at night? Yes. Whose trial? Jesus, the trial of Jesus. And so these very righteous people who were supposed to uphold the law had already broken it. Sometime, sometime earlier. But at least in this circumstance, they throw them into jail. What about the, the man that has been healed? Do they throw him into jail? We don't know for sure. Um, they may have or they may have let him go, but he comes back the next, he's there with them the next day. So they're jailed overnight and then they gather the next day. Where do they gather? In the temple? No. They gather probably, according to archaeology, or archaeological finds, there was a building with a big stone area to, right to the west of the temple. And this was where likely they met. So we see in Acts 4, 5 through 7. What happens next? Let's look at it together. The next day the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Now these are power people. These are, play these are the players. These are the movers and shakers of that time. And then Annas is there. We remember Annas. He was the high priest, although he's retired at this time, but he still retains the title high priest. Annas was the one. Caiaphas, all of those, they were the ones that had condemned Jesus to death. John, Alexander, other, other relatives of the high priest, they kept it in the family. These are, they're all part of the Sadducees. And then what do they do? They brought in the two disciples. Now we talked about this before, and according to the archaeological records, in the gathering of the Sanhedrin, this is what would happen. The 71, so it was 70 elders, plus the high priest, okay? So 71, and they would be seated in a semicircle so that they could all see each other. Then the accused would be brought in, and the accused would stand in the middle of the semicircle, and they'd have to remain standing in front of them. That could be pretty daunting, couldn't it? That could be pretty threatening, couldn't it? Um, we sometimes, when one or two people question our belief or a few family members say something about us, we kind of feel like, oh, imagine standing with Peter and John that morning as they're facing 71 highly educated, very powerful men who have in their hands the ability to choose life or death for Peter and John. And so they stand there. Peter and John know that this is the same group that has condemned Jesus to death. And we, we want to, and I want you to think, you've heard Pastor Renee talking about use your imagination. I want you to use your imagination this morning. What would you feel in that situation? What would you think in that situation? Would you be afraid? I think there would be a temptation to fear, wouldn't there? 
Do you think they would be thinking, what can we say to get out of this? Maybe. How many times do you do that when you kind of get backed up? What can I say so the trouble will go away? That's human nature, isn't it? So they're standing there before all of these people who are gathered. And we want to look, and we began, we, we talked about this, li this last time as well. Think of the opposition that you face at times. Think of the opposition that you face. When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel outnumbered, when somebody laughs at what you believe about God, at what you have been taught, and you feel attacked personally, don't you? We feel it very personally, don't we? God keeps every promise He makes. And when you stand with God, God stands with you. He keeps every promise He make. He makes. When Jesus was with them on earth, He knew what lay ahead for them. He knows what you face. He knows. Jesus, when He walked this earth, knew what was ahead for His disciples. God the Father, who inspired the Holy Scriptures, knew that one day some of you would be in a classroom and your classmates would be so anti-God God knew that some of you would be working in homes where your employers don't believe in God. They may be Buddhist, they may be Taoist, they may be atheist. God knew that one day you would be in a business where all the people around you do business the way the world does business, and that is get ahead at any cost. And you do it differently because you are God's child. God knew that one day you would be in a situation where some of you, you are far from home, you have few resources, you don't always have enough to eat, you don't know what to do, and it seems that the system is against you. And this is what God said. Matthew 10, 18 through 20, and Luke 21, 13 through 15. Let's look at what the, what the Word says in the next slide. You will stand trial before governors and kings. Why? Because you're bad? Because you've done something wrong? No. Why? Because you are my followers. You're my followers. But this will be, and I bolded it, I made it bold, because here's the word I want us to grab this morning. What does, what does Jesus say to his disciples and to us? What does he say? Opportunity. Do you mean persecution... An opposition can be an opportunity? Yes, it can be. I don't know about you, but when there's persecution or opposition, I feel personally attacked. I feel personally threatened. I don't want it to happen. I try to pray it away. But Jesus said to his disciples, this will be your opportunity to do what? To defend yourself? No, to do what? to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me, about me. Here's an opportunity. So brothers and sisters, start changing the way that you're thinking. Opposition comes and persecution comes and I feel like, huh, I'm hurt. I feel like I'm personally attacked. And we do feel that way, don't we? We do. It's, it feels like a personal thing. But God says, don't take it personally. It's not a personal thing. You are being opposed. You are being a pers persecuted, not because of you, but because of me. Because of me. And because it is because of me, I will be with you. You're not going to be on your own. It's not going to be in your own strength. It's not in your own power. I'm with you. You're not in this. It's not your fight. It's my fight, says the Lord God of heaven's armies. It's his fight. And he says, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. How are those wicked rulers? You say, well, I don't have any rulers over me. Do you have people who have power over you, who control your lives? Yes, you do, and so do I. And so this fits here. This is how, this is, this is where we are. 
to tell rulers and other unbelievers, the people around you, you won't always come across rulers day to day to day, but there will be times when you are face to face with those who have seemed to have control of your life or have power over you, and they will oppose you and be against you. And it is in those circumstances that God says, in effect, don't worry to, about defending yourself. What are you going to say? Trying to figure it out. Don't worry about it because you're with, I'm with you. You are my followers and it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. God will give you the right words at the right time. I am not smart enough to figure out and to memorize exactly what to say when they ask me this question. Although I do study Christian apologetics. I do, I, do, I really, that's something that I, I work on. I do study. I do try to learn. Okay, when this question comes up, what are some biblical ways? How can I, how can I reply? And so I do study, but I'll tell you, my brain is not smart enough. It's getting a, well, I don't want to confess something that's not whatever. My brain is not smart enough to remember all of those things that I've read as these, as I read these books and as I study and as I take notes. But God tells me and God tells you, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. Why will God do that? Because it's His battle and you're with Him. You are His representative. You are His soldier. You are part of His army in this fight and in this struggle and in this battle. And brothers and sisters, this applies whether it is at your work, this applies if it is with family members who oppose you and your stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. This applies in every situation. And he says, what does Jesus say? For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That encourages me. It's the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That takes the pressure off me. That helps me to let go of the personal hurt when people oppose me, or attack me, or laugh at me, it's not me. It's God. And He says, I will speak through you. And then in Luke, the same one who's writing the Gospel of A the, the book of Acts, he, then He says, don't worry in advance. You can read more. I'm just giving you two of them. There's more. Jesus says, it's, it's recorded more than, more than these two times. Don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Now, I've included both of these because we're going to see if this is true in this story in just a little bit. But I want you to be encouraged this morning. And I want you to let the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, transform the way you think about opposition. Let the Holy Spirit transform and change the way you feel when people oppose you. Let the truth that we see in the Word of God change our response and our reaction to people. Because in the end, it's not about us. It's not. It feels like it's about us, doesn't it? Because I'm the one that's being laughed at, right? I'm the one that's being mocked. But it's not. It's about God. It's about God. And this is what we see. And so, they stand before Him. They stand before this. But, we are, but as they are, they are spirit-filled followers of the living God, and they don't have to be afraid. Let's see what happens next. Acts 4, 7. They bring in the two disciples and they demand. That's a strong word. They demand. By what power or in whose name have you done this? And this question reminds us of the theme of this whole miracle, isn't it? The name of Jesus. The power in the name of Jesus. And I love this. I want you to look at this with me just a minute. Let me ask you something. Have you ever wondered at times, you want to share with somebody, but you don't know how? Have you, ever want, have you ever thought that? Or you're in a situation and you think, I want to share Jesus with them, but there's no open door, right? How can I make an open door? How can there be a natural lead-in so I can talk about my faith, so I can tell them about God? Brothers and sisters, 
We want something sweet and gentle and nice, and then we can tell them, oh, Jesus loves you. That's what we all want, isn't it? That's not how God always does it. And sometimes God will use opposition and persecution to open a door so that you can share the truth of the gospel. That's what God does. And we see it here, don't we? We see it here. They bring them in. They want to, they want to make them afraid. And they say, by what power in whose name have you done this? Ha! Perfect opportunity. <laughs> right? Could they have asked a better question? No! This is the best question possible. Their enemies are the ones who themselves have opened the door. And what do Peter and John do? Mmm, they grab the opportunity. So the next time you face opposition, the next time you face persecution for your faith, for the way that you live, for living like one of God's holy chosen people, and opposition comes your way, let the Holy Spirit, just say, Holy Spirit, you can ask Him right now, Holy Spirit, remind me of this. You want to just say that right now? Holy Spirit, remind me of this. Holy Spirit, remind me of this when the time comes. And then believe that God who keeps every promise He makes is going to keep His promise for you in your situation. They ask the right question. Oh, Peter and John are just waiting for it, aren't they? Now, what happens next? We see Acts 4, 8 through 10, and I want us to see what Peter says. Uh, by the way, Peter is the one who's being recorded, but, Jane, uh, but John is part of it as well. And in the Greek, it, it, it implies that John at times is speaking also. So John is not just silent, but you know, you know our brother Peter. You know he's a talker, right? And then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit. Now stop here just a minute, and I didn't, I studied it and prepared yesterday, but because of time, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but I want us to see something this morning as we think about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, okay? Before this point, let me ask you, has Peter been filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. You go all the way back to Acts chapter 2. Okay, and when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, it said, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all, it says they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So there is a first, we sometimes use different words. The first time they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came. He baptizes them. So Peter has been baptized in the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit. What happened that first time? Did Peter speak in other tongues in the beginning? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yes, because the Bible tells us they all spoke in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. Okay? Now, look at this situation. Let me ask you something. Has Peter dropped down on his knees and suddenly started praying at this point? Yes or no? No. He has not. Does Peter, when he's filled with the Holy Spirit this time, does he start speaking in other tongues, in another language that God has given him? Yes or no? No, he does not. Here is one of the works of the Holy Spirit. Now after this, does Peter at other times speak in other tongues and is filled with the Holy Spirit again? Yes! We'll read about it at the very end of this chapter again. Because at the end of this chapter, it will say, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and the place was shaken. So it happens again. But here's something different. Here's the work of the Holy Spirit. And when I read this, I was so encouraged. Because at this point, Peter is not saying, oh, okay, God, help me now because I've got to say just the right words to these enemies of mine. And I don't want to blow it. Do you ever think that? I don't want to blow it. I want to make sure I say just the right words. Brothers and sisters, go back to what we read earlier. Don't worry about it. Walk with God. Study the Word of God. Pray as you have time. But trust God that when you come to a, to a point of opposition or persecution and suddenly somebody opposes you, rather than saying, wait just a minute. Oh God, help me right now. What am I going to say? <laughs> okay. Instead of thinking about it that way, trust God, the Holy Spirit, who is with you always. 
and we see this beautiful picture here of the work of the Holy Spirit. He's not speaking in other tongues, but at this moment, the meaning here is that there was a sudden and strong impression and, and not just impression, but a sudden equipping and empowering of the Holy Spirit in the moment of need, in the time of need. And brothers and sisters, as you walk with God and as you are full of the Holy Spirit and as you're praying in the Spirit day by day by day, as you walk with Him, you can trust God that when those times come and you're faced with something and you weren't expecting it and you don't know what to do and you don't know what to say, you can trust God, the Holy Spirit, to fill you and to give you the words to say and to lead you to do the words that come from God Himself in heaven, coming down out of heaven into you and through you for God's purposes. That's what God does. That's how He does it. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Now, it doesn't mean that you and I can be lazy and just say, well, okay, God's going to do it, so I don't have to worry about it. And it doesn't mean that you, can, you and I can say, well, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit a month ago or last year, and so, you know, it's up to the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, be being filled. There's a continual filling of the Holy Spirit. But when there are times of crisis, crisis, and we all have that, you can trust God. If you will follow this through, do you know what? You will see that exactly this same thing shows up in other places in the book of Acts. Do you know when you will see it again? You will see it when Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church, was standing there. And his enemies have picked up stones and they're ready to put him to death in a terrible, terrible manner. And you know what the Bible says? And then it says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. And it's the same thing again. And in that moment, when you and I naturally would be so afraid, wouldn't you be afraid in the natural? You're, you're facing all these people. They have stones. They're going to throw them at you and kill you. It's going to hurt. I, 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 I sometimes I think about that and I think, oh, oh, Lord, oh, oh, God. But you can trust, oh, brothers and sisters, we do not yet know what is ahead. We do not yet know the opposition that may yet come should the Lord Jesus tarry. The time may come when you as a Christian and I as a Christian will be physically persecuted for our faith and for our stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't, don't start running in the other direction and don't be afraid because you know what? There are brothers and sisters of yours this morning. This morning, they're already facing that in North Korea, in Sudan, in many other places, in Myanmar, in other places, in India this morning. There are people today that are being martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Today, you just may not hear about it because it's in a village. It's in an out-of-the-way place. And we hear about these things and we think about these things and, we, and we, it's so easy to be afraid and let the fear of, of what, might, what might happen fill our hearts. But you don't have to be afraid because the Holy Spirit is with you. He's with you as He was with Stephen. The Bible says Stephen, as he faced them, death, imminent death, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says what about Stephen at that moment? Stephen looked to heaven. Oh, this, these words burn in my heart. He looked to heaven and you know what he saw? He saw not his enemy. He saw not the stones in people's hands. He saw Jesus. Look, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father because Jesus was getting ready to welcome one of his precious children saints and one of his precious brothers into the very presence of God. And Stephen was not full of fear. And Stephen was not full of doubt. But Stephen, because he had the infilling of the Holy Spirit, who, what did Jesus say about the Spirit? I will send a comforter, some comforter, a strengthener, an advocate, and he will be with you. And you can count on it. You can count on it. Do you see this again somewhere? You'll see it again.
You follow along with Paul as he's on, his, on the first missionary journey. And they come to a place where they're preaching the gospel and he is opposed by a demonic, a demon-filled sorcerer who's trying to oppose the gospel. And do you know what the Bible says in that situation? The Bible says that Paul looks at him and it says, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, then calls and says, you son of, and then he in the, in the name of Jesus and in the power of Jesus pronounces judgment on this person. Listen, brothers and sisters, we live in a world that opposes God and there will be times when you are persecuted and opposed by demonic forces that are beyond you. And in the natural, you, you will be afraid. And in the natural, you think, I can't fight against that. And you're right. You cannot. And I cannot. But I don't have to fight against that. And you don't have to fight against that. Because the Holy Spirit is with you. And He will give you discernment. And He will give you insight. And He will give you understanding. And He will give you power to stand and to walk and to proclaim in the face of the enemy the mighty name and the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 And so it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, I like this. The old Peter fought for himself. The old Peter took everything personally, didn't he? But the new Peter is full of the Holy Spirit has been baptized by the Holy Spirit, is walking in the Holy Spirit, and receives a special equipping at this moment, says, turns the tables on them, and he says, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done what? A good deed for a crippled man? I love this. I love this. Peter and John are on trial, but guess what? With one question, who's on trial? Peter and John? No! The council is now on trial. He says, are we being called to account because we did a kind deed? And, it's, and I love that because Peter turns the tables, but it's not Peter's wisdom. Peter was uncouth, uneducated beyond the age of about 12 or 13. He had not received formal official training. He was not a lawyer. He wasn't all of this. But he didn't have to be because there was a lawyer who was standing on his behalf. And what was the name of the lawyer in this situation? The, the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit? He will be your advocate. That's another name for a lawyer, your paraclete, your helper, and into this courtroom full of people that hate Jesus and put Him to death, the Holy Spirit comes and He is their advocate. And brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is your advocate, your helper, your equipper, your comforter. You are not on your own. You're not on your own. Be encouraged by what we see this morning in this story. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. And so, and we begin to see God answering, his, keeping His promise, right? Remember, He says, don't worry about it. The words that you speak, they will be the words that come from the Father. And then what He says, do you want to know how He was healed? Verse 10, let me clearly state to you, and to all of the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Mm, the man you crucified, but whom what? God raised from the dead. Now, you remember the last time we looked at this? Remember what we said? This is the theme. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the theme of every message of the early church because that is the hope that we have. And in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have hope. And Peter says, you put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. When you stand for Jesus, he will stand with you. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of the Father speaking through Him. That's how Jesus does it. That's how the Holy Spirit does it. And then look with me at Acts 4.12. Peter's not trying to win an argument. Listen, look at this. Be encouraged and let the Holy Spirit change the way you think. Let the Holy Spirit change the way you do things. 
How many of you have ever gotten into a discussion that sort of turned into an argument about God, not God, God, not God? Have you? Okay. All of us have. And there's our human nature, and our human nature wants to do what? I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah? Our human nature wants to win the argument. Yes? That's our human nature. We want to win the argument. But brothers and sisters, God is not interested in winning arguments. God is interested in winning people. He's interested in winning people. So the next time this comes and you face this, let God start now changing the way you think and the way that you do things. It's not about winning an argument. It's about winning a people. And here is Peter. They have been on trial. And Peter, instead of trying to, he started off by saying, is this why we're on trial? Uh, let me tell you, it was Jesus. Peter takes it off the personal, says it's about Jesus. And then, you know what he starts doing? He's trying, he's evangelizing them. That's what he's doing. He's, evan he's not trying to win an argument. He's trying to win them. How does, what does he say? There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Peter's not trying to defend himself anymore. Peter wants them to know there's salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that you put to death. But hey, there's hope. God raised him from the dead. And if you want life, and if you want hope, then you must come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be saved. And he's saying that to a group of people who keep all the law, who do all these good deeds, who say, Abraham is our father, and who, who are, are the keepers of the temple. And Peter says to them, in effect, but that's not enough. That's not good enough. You must come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name. There's no other name. Praise the Lord. That encourages me, and I hope it encourages you. Because we get in arguments with people, especially people that laugh at us and mock us and that are opposed to us. And we start... <laughs> we want to fight, don't we? We want to... We, we, that's the human nature. But brothers and sisters, we are beyond the human nature. We are not people of this world. We are people of God. We're people of God. And God can change you. And God can transform you because He wants to win people to Himself. He wants people who are going to hell to go to heaven. He wants people who are lost to be found. He wants people who laugh at Him, mock Him, spit on Him, use His name in vain, instead to fall on their knees and say, Oh, have mercy on me, a sinner. And He's going to do that through you. And He's going to do that through me. And many times He's going to do that through opposition through opposition. That's how he's going to do it. That's how he's going to do it. They're going to listen to your words. They're going to look at your life. They're going to see your gentleness of character when they're not gentle to you. That's what they're going to see. And God's going to use that to touch their hearts. And he says there's no other name. God has given no other name. There's a beautiful verse in 1 Timothy 2. Two beautiful verses, 2, 5, and 6. And this is so when we look at this. Look at this with me. Just a, just a reminder. I know that you know this, but here's this beautiful reminder that Paul writes. He says, For there is only one God and one mediator. What's a mediator? What's a mediator? Somebody give me a, another word or phrase for that. A go-between a go-between, one who can reach both sides, right? One who can speak to both sides. And he says, there's only one who can reconcile. Give me another word for reconcile. Anybody? Recon instead of reconcile, give me an easier word for that. Can you think of an easier word? Toby. To make up. 
to reconcile. You've been enemies and now you're friends. You've been, there's been a wall and the wall is broken down. To reconcile. Let me ask you something. Now you're all laughing back there. Why are you laughing? You got another word for it? Bring huh? together. Well, say, say again. Bring together. Bring together, Walali. That's right. To bring together a, a mediator. And I, I love... I love this picture, and it's a little bit like this. Let's say that, are we taping? Sorry. <laughs> Let's say that Ida and Juvie have had a fight. And, and it's hard for, it's, now this is an imperfect example because God doesn't have a fight, okay? This is an <laughs> earthly example, okay? So think about it another way. And they're not at a place where they can talk to each other. They can't come together to make it up. And so a good friend, of Ida's and a good friend of Juvie's comes and becomes what? A mediator, a go-between. And that person <laughs> that mediator takes Ida's hand and that mediator takes Juvie's hand and what does that mediator do? Reconciles, brings together makes up. And that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. It's just a simple picture. Do you remember the, the testimony I told you, we told you uh, a couple of months ago when we were in China in the summer English camp? And I think it was in, in Beth's class. And God opened the door for her really, really, really to share the gospel with these fourth, third and fourth graders or whatever. And she started all the way back in Genesis and started talking about God and man. And they were friends. And then man sinned. And she had to put it in language that children children could understand, because these are kids who would never heard about Jesus before. And she asked the question, and so man did something bad, and they weren't friends with God anymore. And she asked the class, what could man do to be friends with God again? Do you remember what one of the little kids said? Beautiful answer that God the Holy Spirit revealed to that child. The child looked up and said, there's nothing they could do. There's nothing they could do. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing men and women who are lost can do. Jesus has to do it. And that's why there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. That's why, brothers and sisters, we must preach not our church. We must preach not our good deeds. We must preach not our programs. We must preach Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven. Only Jesus can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus. And then verse 6, so beautiful. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. I love that God gave this message at just the right time. Let me ask you something. I want to make it just very personal right now. Those of you that have saved, that have, those of you that have taken the hand of Jesus and the, with the hand of God, that's a way to look at it. Do you remember when at just the right time Jesus purchased your freedom. You received the freedom of Jesus. Jesus did it long ago. But do you remember when that happened? Do you remember the peace in your heart? Do you remember the guilt that just drained away? Do you remember the joy that came from knowing, I'm free. I don't have to keep trying. I'm not in bondage. I don't have to live this way. I'm free. I'm friends with God. I'm friends with God. You know, there's a song in the church that I did not like for a long, long time. I'm sorry to tell you. I really didn't like it. I think it was an Israel Houghton song. I just didn't like it. I'm a friend of God. I, I, I just didn't like that song. I thought it's, it's too flippant. It's too light. It's too... It just... I'm sorry that some of you say, I love that song. That's my favorite song. I'm just being honest with you. I just didn't like that song. I just thought, hey... Mm. But the Lord began to change. It's still not my favorite song, okay? <laughs> it's not my favorite song.
But the Lord began to change my heart, and I began to appreciate the message of the song, which is, I am a friend of God, because there was a go-between who brought me together, and that was Jesus Christ. That was Jesus Christ. There's only one. There's only one. I want you to look at one other thing and we're going to stop here. Let's look at the next slide and I'll come back to some of this the next time. I want you to look at Acts 4.9 and Acts 4.12 as we close. And I want you to see something as Peter is preaching. Because Peter's not trying to win an argument. Peter's trying to win people. And I want you to see something here. In Acts 4.9, Peter says, Do you want to know how he was healed? Look at this word, healed. And this word means restored to health and made whole. And then he comes to the end of his sermon in Acts 4.12. And he says, there's no other name by which we must be saved. Guess what? This word and this word, they are the same word in the Greek. Did you know that? It's the same root word. It's the same root word. Because when Jesus comes, He's the same Jesus. He brings wholeness. He brings health. He brings healing. He brings salvation. And Peter wants them to know that. And God wants us to know that as well. He says, this is how He was healed. This is how we are saved. When we close this morning, we'll come back. I'll, I'll, I've got half a sermon still here. We'll, come, we'll, we'll look at it in the future again. But oh, brothers and sisters, there's no other name. When opposition comes, don't be afraid. When mockery or laughter comes, don't be afraid. Don't run. But God the Holy Spirit will be with you. Let's close in prayer this morning and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and remind